Okay, so welcome to this next video in the theory of probability. In this video, what we're going to discuss is uh, how to transform random variables. And we've done this in many videos before, uh, but now in this video, what we're going to do is formalize that theory and generalize it to an arbitrary case. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so uh, this is the setup. So to keep it, well, uh, we will discuss the abstract case, but to keep it concrete, we'll always have a specific example in mind. So we have some abstract probability space here and um, if you uh, if you want to um, if you want to have a concrete example in mind uh, you can think of the probability space as being uh, we are selecting a human from the human population that's a very nice way of, uh, a nice example to think about because it's you know it's a finite probability space it's very very nice basically it's intuitive so we have every single human on the planet, and you are selecting a human at random, and uh, basically that's the experiment. You just select a human at random, and there are obviously lots of different outcomes of selecting a human, because there are 7 billion humans on the planet, so uh, there are lots of humans to choose from. Right, uh, and... Um, the uh, probability of selecting an individual human. So again, uh, because it's a finite probability space, what we can do is we can stick every human, which is an outcome of the experiment, we can put that in a set by itself and stick that set containing a single outcome. So uh, remember, a probability space consists of three things. The sample space, which is the set of outcomes of the experiment. So that's the set of all humans in, on the planet. Then it has a set of, a set of events which is given this symbol curly F, which is uh, a set of subsets of uh, this sample space. In the case of a finite probability space, you can just think of it as the power set. In fact, it's the entire power set uh, of this, i.e. Uh, you take subsets of the sample space. So let's say uh, this is a subset of all these people here, these two people here. That's a subset. That will be in this set of events. Uh, in the case of continuous, uh, run, uh, continuous more well, non-discrete, non fi well, even worse than that, non-discrete uh, probability spaces, so uh, where you've got a continuum of uh, outcomes, uh, then uh, this is much, much more difficult to handle, and it becomes much more complicated than in the finite case. But in the finite case, you can just think of the set of events as being every possible subset of the sample space. And uh, why is that an event? Because it's, say, uh, these two, say we split it up, and say we split the population into two, which is the boys and the girls, and the subset of the population, which is the boys, is a, well, it's a subset, so it's in this set of events, and basically, uh, uh, that is the event, the, uh, the, intuitively that's the event that when you pick, um, when you pick a person at random you get a boy uh, as opposed to a girl. So um, that's why these sets correspond to events, okay? So uh, it's uh, a possibility, a possible out, uh, a, well it's more, it's different from that, it's, um, it's an event, that's what it is. Um, it's a bunch of outcomes all put together and you're now comp uh, saying that okay we don't want a specific outcome to occur but we want our outcome to be in there what's the probability of that happening okay uh, and again you ascribe a probability you have a probability measure which ascribes every every uh, set in this set of events it ascribes it a probability between 0 and 1 and that obeys a lot of a bunch of axioms. So it obeys axioms such as uh, counterpart additivity, meaning that if you have two events, uh, say this one and this one, then if you union them together and they are disjoint, so that means that this one intersect to this one is empty, i.e. there are no uh, shared outcomes in both of them, uh, then if you union them together, the probability of that new bigger set uh, is equal to the probability of the two pieces added together, basically. That's what counterpart additivity means, and also it obeys the property that the probability of the whole space is equal to 1. Okay, uh, so uh, we've uh, seen before that a, uh, we can uh, ascribe a random variable such as height to every single person, and that basically is a function which ascribes a real number to every single person. Now, uh, obviously height will ascribe a non-negative real number, uh, but more generally a random variable will just ascribe to the outcomes of a probability space, it will just ascribe a real number. And the idea is that we are building another probability space over here in the real numbers, such that this probability space is going to be homomorphic as far as the probability space structure is concerned to this one, i.e. Uh, this is going to have a sample space which is consisting of real numbers and it's going to, let's call that omega prime, it's going to have a set of events 
and it's going to have a probability measure on them and we want this structure to be effectively mirroring this structure here so if you take a real number little x uh, here then uh, if you put that into uh, in if you put that into a set by itself that might be an event in here and basically it will have a corresponding event back here which is all of the people who had that height x so all of the people who were mapped onto uh, that value x by this random variable h so all of these people in here who were ascribed the value x by this height function, uh, they uh, comprise a subset of this probability space and basically uh, that's the first condition that every event back here has a corresponding event uh, in this original probability space and also that P prime of the events in here is the same as P of the event of the uh, corresponding event back here. So basically we want P prime of uh, this singleton containing x uh, to be the same as uh, the probability of uh, the inverse image of this value x. So let's write that uh, h inverse of x, where h inverse of x means all uh, people in our original probability space who were ascribed the value x by the function h. Okay. So we have this random variable. Now, uh, the random variable takes values in the real numbers. So, what we now consider is another function, g, which maps the real numbers onto the real numbers. So, it's a mapping between the real numbers. And basically, we could act g on this probability space here. So we could uh, map every real number in here onto another real number according to this mapping. And uh, there's a bunch of properties that, uh, to make this simpler, uh, we are going to assume uh, g obeys. The first is that g is a strictly increasing function, and I'll explain why all of these are necessary. Uh, strictly increasing, and we're also going to assume that g is differentiable. Uh, when we are considering these transformations. It's just more difficult if you don't assume those and you have to really go back to basic principles. So, uh, the usual way you view uh, functions which map the real numbers, so g is a function mapping the real numbers onto the real numbers. The usual way you view these sort of functions is as a graph. So, um, for instance, uh, here is, uh, I want to draw one, here's x cubed, this is a nice function, something that looks like that approximately, so I'll move this up. So here is a function which is taking every real number along this real line and it's mapping it onto another real number, so it's ascribing to every real number in this real line, it's ascribing another real number uh, and we plot that as a graph, it's, it's a very nice way of visualising it, but you could just view it like this and in a way that's the better way to view it as far as what we're doing here, that it is is just taking every real number and it's ascribing to it another real number. That's all this graph shows. It's saying, give me a real number and this here is the uh, new real number ascribed to that value. Okay, so strictly increasing means that uh, if you take a point a little x here, um, then if you go forward, if you go forward to let's say an x prime where x prime is greater than x, then that implies that the value that this function ascribes to so this g prime, sorry, this uh, the value that the function g ascribes to x prime, g of x prime here, which is this value here, is also going to be greater than g of x. So basically, if you make your real number in the domain bigger, uh, you go up in the codomain as well. And uh, uh, just to, a bit of terminology, the uh, set on which the function acts is called the domain and the set which you're mapping into is called the codomain or the range. Uh, there are multiple terms for it. Okay, so this axis here is denoting the uh, codomain in a, for our function and this axis here is, um, is uh, denoting the domain. Okay, uh, so strictly increasing means that differentiable is a property uh, that um, that is explored hugely in real analysis, but basically differentiable means that um, firstly you're continuous, so um, all differentiable functions are continuous, that's the basic theorem of real analysis, so you don't have any points like that where you have a sudden jump, uh, or uh, but it's more than that because it has to actually have a, uh, a continuous, uh, sorry, it has to have a, a derivative at every point. So, you can't have bits like this, you can't have corners basically, because at that point it doesn't have a derivative. Uh, so, a differentiable, a function being differentiable means that it has a derivative everywhere. Uh, so that means, strictly speaking, that the limit as uh, h approaches 0 of f of x plus h 
minus f of x divided by h exists for all x is an element of the real numbers, basically. And what this does is, if you uh, intuitively, what this is saying is, um, take a point little x here, it has a value f of x here, then go forward by a tiny little amount h, so go to x plus h, uh, we've already said the function is strictly increasing, so we'll know that f of x plus h is greater than f of x. So we go to f of x plus h here, and then what you do is you find out how much bigger f of x plus h is than f of x. So that gives you uh, this top bit of the quotient here, this bit here. This gives you this tiny little, uh, this tiny little uh, um, amount here, how much the difference between these two. So you could also view it as this difference here. And then what it does is it divides it by this value h here. So it divides it by h, which is this, and h is this tiny little difference here. So basically what it does is it imagines, it, well actually it doesn't imagine, it does. So if I draw this picture bigger, you have something like this. Here is x, here is x plus h. And what it's imagining doing is drawing a straight line between those two points, and it's taking the gradient of that straight line. So this is, this is your h, so this is your green bit. This is your f of x plus h minus f of x here, and you're taking the gradient, the ratio between them, which will find you the gradient of that line. Okay, so uh, strictly speaking, what it does is it is it takes the gradient of the secant line uh, to a curve at a point x, okay, uh, where you go forward an amount h. And what you then do is you take uh, the limit of this as h gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you make h smaller and smaller. So if you imagine, you could uh, you could imagine forming a sequence where you each time you half the value of h, and uh, you then you could start off with h is equal to one, and you could work out what the gradient of the secant line is. So you'd get f of x plus one minus let's say f of x divided by one, and then we could half again. You could go to f of x plus a half uh, minus f of x divided by a half, and you could go on. So you could then go to f of x uh, plus a third, and you could make this h uh, go down as, you can make h equal 1 over n, and basically you could make the arbitrary terms of the sequence, xn, you could make them, um, you could make it equal to f of x plus 1 over n, minus f of x, divided by 1 over n, and then what you're doing is taking the limit of that sequence. So you'll gradually make h smaller and smaller and smaller, and you get the sequence of these um, of these uh, quotients, of these gradients of these secant lines, and basically you're taking the limit of that, and what that is effectively doing is finding the exact tangent to the curve, basically. And uh, for this process to work, for this limit to exist, um, basically, the tangent has to actually exist. So, uh, intuitively, if you've got a curve drawn like this, and the tangent is obviously existing, then this should, if the tangent is clearly well defined, i.e. you can draw a tangent to the curve at the point x, then this uh, derivative will exist, basically. Uh, it's the intuitive way of viewing that. Okay, so uh, we'll continue with this discussion in the next video.